Good morning, everybody, and welcome uh, to the Leading Change session. Real quick, my name is Chuck Powell. I'm from the Office of Leadership and Institutional Development at the USO. Um, our office offers executive coaching, change management, leadership development, organizational development, and assessments. Um, feel free to contact us, and if we can't help you, we'll find somebody who will. That being said, let me, let me get to our, our prime event today. Um, as you as you all heard yesterday, um, momentum is a very uh, important initiative, and it ranges across the overall system, and it's involved the leadership every campus at multiple levels um, to achieve momentous system change in the midst of global change. Um, and today we're going to hear from some key leaders how they've navigated that change. So let me introduce to you, first of all, we have Johnny Evans, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at the College of Coastal Georgia. We have Shodron Gill, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of North Georgia. Deborah Matthews, Interim Provost at Middle Georgia State University. And Jennifer Standender, who's Vice President for Enrollment Management at Middle Georgia. Jennifer has having some technical difficulties, so we might not see her today. And finally, Ramon Stort, the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Fort Valley State University. Um, so that takes us to our questions. Um, and we have a number of prompts to talk about relating to leadership and change, especially as they relate to momentum. Bill George and others attribute um, authentic leadership to learning about our life story. So first question for the panel is, how did you learn to lead and what has your journey been to get to this point? Um, and if you don't mind, Shodron, I'd like to start with you. Thank you, Chuck. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, in thinking about this question, you know, how do you learn to lead? I, you know, I could take you all the way back to my childhood and I could talk about leadership roles, e even starting in you know, middle school and high school through college, I think there were lessons that I learned then that I carried forward. But if I think about my professional journey, my role, uh, my rich provost office has been rather unconventional. I was never a department chair and I've never been a dean. Um, instead, I've had roles like um, being director of the Center for Teaching, Learning and Leadership. Um, I've worked extensively in student success. I was the, uh, an associate vice president for student success efforts. Um, I, I've overseen academic related areas. I've been on the ground in helping start programs or start initiatives. And what I think that that, that allowed me to develop was a really big picture view of how universities function. Um, it exposed me in Georgia to the system very early and, and seeing how the system and institutions work together. And it really, really stressed building collaborative skills and communicating. Um, frequently, I was in a role where I had very little direct authority. And so I had to really work hard at building consensus, um, at listening to other people's voices and to leading through persuasion. And, and getting buy-in. And I, I think that prepared me well for moving in first to the vice provost role and then to the provost role. So those are, are sort of key experiences. Um, I approach my role and, and have in every position that I've been in, thinking about how can I be an advocate for the, the people that I think of as my constituents, be it the students, the faculty, the departments, um, the college, what, whatever that is, but being an advocate and being a facilitator of others' work. How do I get the resources, align the systems, um, align the, the, the processes, the right group of people together to facilitate things moving ahead? Uh, in my current role and in more recent roles, there's you know, clearly been some sort of vision setting components as well. But I think a collaborative approach of listening to voices and um, integrating them into the decision making, being as transparent as possible, has, has been a real strength. 
I'd also like to do a shout out to some of the leadership development programs, particularly the ones that the system offers. Um, I have benefited from um, participating in ELI and also at ALI, as well as some national and regional leadership programs. And those really provided a great opportunity to reflect on, on my strengths and reflect on areas that I wanted to grow in and develop strategies to address those. So I would encourage anyone on a, on a leadership path to take advantage of those opportunities when you have them. Thank you. There's so many helpful concepts uh, uh, and you know, reflection is, is so important. I also like that you talked about the indirect leadership that we have to provide sometimes when we're not in that actual position to bring about leadership and collaboration. Uh, let, me, let me turn it over to Johnny. Yeah, I, I'm, I was fortunate to grow up um, with uh, leaders in my family all around me. My, uh, one of my grandfathers was a county commissioner, another one was state park superintendent of two state parks in the state of Georgia. Uh, one of my grandmothers was uh, a leader in um, getting the, the, the sewing factories back in the, in the uh, mid-1900s, in having unions in those sewing factories and navigating that, that complex time as a leader, um, to my father being uh, an officer in the military for 20 years and, and growing up and in, in seeing that. It was natural for me to be around leaders that had to work with groups and teens and diverse groups and, and learn how to buy consensus, get consensus and buy-in. Um, uh, just as Chandra was talking about the, the persuading people in a positive way, not manipulating people and getting people to buy into the cause and to go in the direction, the vision, the mission of the, of the, of the institution is it, what I watched happen my entire life. And I was fortunate to have great leaders um, reach out to me and mentor me. They saw something in me that I didn't see in my own self uh, at early in, in uh, my career and, and brought me along and mentored me and provide me the opportunities to, to go to training or to sit in on certain groups and place me in, in small leadership roles and increase my responsibility along the way. Um, I took, took a more traditional approach to becoming a provost. I was a faculty member, went to the faculty ranks, department chair level in, uh, in curriculum director level work to a dean's position and now uh, a provost. And so had that more traditional approach um, that, that people might expect that happens with provosts. I don't think it's any better than what Chandra talked about. In fact, I, would, I think she had more opportunities maybe that, that I didn't have in, in learning some leadership uh, skills. And so I, I've had the fortune of people just recognizing those opportunities for me and placing me in those those uh, roles to lead and how you learn to lead I think a lot of it is by falling flat on your face sometimes and getting back up and then and then having people to put you in those opportunities to, to win or fail and, and recognizing that neither one of those are bad when you fail or when you win they, they can both move you forward and, and it comes by just experiencing that at the same time, being very authentic, like you talked about, Chuck, and, and knowing everyone's story and, and realizing that if you're doing it by yourself, you're not leading. Um, so you really, relationship is super important with people in order to, to lead people to toward something like momentum approach. It requires a good relationship and understanding of what's going on. Thank you for bringing up uh, leadership development through failure. Um, it, it's something, you know, it's what we, what we take with those events. I, I, if you don't mind, I want to ask you a follow-up question relating back to some of the mentorship. Are you, do you seek opportunities now that you're in the leadership position to, to provide mentorship or offer other opportunities for mentorship? I do. It, 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 it really had an impact on my, on my personal style. Because I recognize that if I wouldn't have read this particular book, maybe in my 20s, I wouldn't have had this perspective. And, or if I hadn't been to this conference, or if I didn't get to watch this fundraising event and this speaker at this fundraising event and learn and debrief with an experienced fundraiser about what, 
what they did on the stage at that moment to raise that amount of money in, in a short time that if I hadn't, that if I hadn't had those experiences, I wouldn't be where I am. So I'm very intentional about watching for opportunity for others to, to gain experience with me and to put them in positions of leadership and to develop their resumes. You know, one of the things that I think higher ed does really well is we turn out students, right? We spend four five, six years with a student to build a resume and launch them. But I think what higher ed has often not done well is done the same thing for their faculty and staff. Um, we tend to want to protect them and their mind, and we don't want them to go anywhere, but we should be developing faculty and staff in that same manner that we develop students, preparing them to go off and do great things and maybe that's in your same institution, but maybe it's elsewhere, but you get to be a part of that journey and it, it, you have to be very intentional about it. So yes, it, it is definitely a part of my leadership style that is affected by what those leaders did to me. Thank you. Uh, Ramon, we hear about your leadership journey. Uh, well, good morning again, and thank you for the question. And I tell you, after hearing Shadron and, and actually Johnny, you know, it, it, it reminds me a lot of mine. Um, first and foremost, I came from humble beginnings. And I think when you come from humble beginnings, you realize that um, one of the key things you need to do is try to figure out how to make a dollar out of 15 cents. As Tupac would say, just a simple dime and a nickel. Uh, but when you start to do that, you start to become creative. And when you become creative, you start to become a, uh, a visionary because you see where you want to go, but then more importantly, you're willing to be innovative and creative in a way to get there. And so it, it starts with, for me, wanting to serve. You know, there are a lot of research on servant leadership. And then the, the thing I'll say, and I, I, I think being a leader, one of the things you want to be is you want to be organic. Um, I know people study leadership and different things, but I almost think of leadership as kind of like the karate kid. Uh, remember, uh, Daniel's son was taught to paint the fence. Daniel's son was taught to wax on and wax off. And he just thought that he was doing menial tasks. But in the end, Mr. Miyagi had taught him how to fight. And so I think through your experience, through honing of uh, your commitment to being a servant, uh, you develop the leadership skills that are appropriate to provide vision, to provide inspiration, and most importantly, provide an opportunity for everybody to get on board and move in a direction. This, this point that you made about creativity and innovation, um, everybody's so busy with trying to accomplish results. How do, you, how do you carve out time? How do you carve out the opportunity for creativity and innovation? Well, for me, I always, uh, when, when somebody tells me how busy they are, I usually go in the opposite direction. Because usually if somebody starts with how busy they are, they're basically telling you that, in my opinion, they do not have time for you. What happens is I believe that we all make time for the things that are important to us. And through that, we go through and prioritize. So it's not that you have more than 24 hours in a day or uh, more than 60 minutes in an hour or, or 60 seconds in a minute. It's none of that. It's just you go through, you prioritize, you understand what you cannot put off till tomorrow. And then through that prioritization, you go through and you're organized and you eat that elephant one bite at a time. Thank you very much. Deborah. I'm still trying to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> so, um, I, there are parts of all of the stories that I've heard that are that are comparable to mine. Uh, but rather than go back to my Girl Scouting days, I will say that uh, I'm still, in many respects, learning how to to lead. Um, it has been somewhat of a traditional path to this point, and also untraditional at the same same time. I started here at then Macon State many years ago as a part time faculty member. And I frequently say to people, I'd never skip a step. So I was a part-timer, uh, one year temporary, went through all of the ranks up through full professor, uh, served in numerous administrative roles over the years, including um, 
coordinators, uh, department chairs of three different populations, uh, associate dean, uh, dean. Uh, actually, I was dean before I became associate dean. So we had a reorganization. So my school went away and then I became associate dean. Uh, from the associate dean's office to the provost's office as an associate provost, I was associate provost for nine months before becoming interim provost uh, during the pandemic at the end of March and coming into to April. So I've been in this current role since then. Uh, in terms of my, the way that I lead, I think more in, in terms of creating an environment of uh, cooperation and service, um, listening to uh, everyone involved, and then making a decision based on the best information available to me at that, that time. Uh, I'm often reminded of a quote from Mary McLeod Bethune, who talked about, you know, she started her school with just a couple of dollars and some change, but she talked about using her learning and her education, not to place herself above those around her, but rather to foster a spirit of service and cooperation and learning. Uh, and I've kind of taken that, that approach over the years that I've, that I've been here. And now Chuck's muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to our second question. Um, the momentum year is all about establishing change at scale. How have you approached this? And Deborah, since your, your voice is, is limbered up, we're gonna go back to you. Okay. Well, at Middle Georgia, we have a school-based strategy uh, and it is to give students a sense of, while they're part of a, a larger picture, but to give them that sense of being part of a smaller community. And within that strategy, there are six schools and each dean is empowered to make decisions uh, within his or her own school within, within that realm. Um, I meet individually with the deans every other week. We meet as a group on those alternate weeks. Uh, but in terms of scaling during the momentum, I'll use the uh, academic mindset as an example. You know, we've had uh, workshops on academic mindsets. Uh, each school has established an academic mindset plan, which they're starting to, to implement. Uh, we have worked towards uh, our early alert system, kind of increasing it gradually over time. We started with looking at students who were in 1,000 and 2,000 level courses. Now we're advancing to 3,000 level courses. Uh, like many of you, we've been involved with the uh, co-requisite model for English and, and math. Uh, we're currently using our learning support English as part of uh, our G2C redesign plan. So it, it is an ongoing process and uh, we're making uh, changes as the situations warrant. So could you talk just a little bit more because you, you mentioned it earlier about creating the environment and then you talked about empowerment. How, how do you empower those around you? Because this is so important. I think that the challenge becomes making sure that people feel that they're being heard. Um, although ultimately as, as a leader, you have to make a decision, but gaining, gathering input uh, from individuals, whether it's a faculty member or even the faculty Senate, for example, is the president and I are both on the agenda for every faculty Senate meeting. We're listening to people. Uh, and it doesn't just stop with, with faculty. Uh, I think it goes for students as, as well. When we had to make an adjustment in our calendar, um, due to the COVID, um, I thought I would hear from people about taking away the Thanksgiving break, you know, so that we could end earlier. I didn't hear anything about the Thanksgiving break, but spring break became another issue <laughs> when we took away spring break so the students wouldn't be going home and then coming, coming back. Uh, so that adjustment to the calendar resulted in conversations with our student government association. And we're, we're very fortunate here to have a strong SGA. You know, they did their own uh, survey, um, came up with some suggestions. They want activities during that week, even though they understand that they will still have to go to classes. And so we've had discussions with the deans about those suggestions. We're starting to implement some things and making some plans in, in that way. So we're working across uh, areas. With our uh, enrollment, for example, we have weekly enrollment task force meetings uh, with all stakeholders 
involve from academic affairs, from the registrar's office, uh, enrollment management, housing. So the discussions are ongoing uh, as we use the data to make decisions, but also we're getting input and hearing the voices of all those who are concerned. So I'm hearing that there's there's meaningful and sustained engagement with a number of, of different parties. Yes, that's exactly it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let me turn it over to you, Shodran, about, about the momentum year and establishing change at scale. So beginning with the momentum approach, um, I, I think our initial strategy was to see how we could align our activities with momentum approach with other initiatives that were ongoing, really believing that if we could, um, one, demonstrate how the initiatives tied to our, our mission and our values, that this was not sort of a one-off or a, a temporary sort of thing, but aligned with who we were and what our goals were, and then show alignment of a variety of initiatives that they may have been called by different names, but that they were all components of the same thing. So for example, our QEP was focused on advising and um, getting students to graduation on time on target, helping them develop purposeful choice, helping them um, have a clear pathway, working with the academic departments to, um, to create very clear programs of study. So um, intensive advising that helps students um, I think of it as a process of discernment so that they go through that discernment in their freshman year and make sure that their goals are on track with their program of study. We were already engaged in that work. So when we started working with the momentum approach, it made sense to, to sort of tackle the low hanging fruit and really work on showing that that was part of the same process and what we, what we could do to continue taking that to scale. So I would say we, we optimized the areas where we already had things going that were going well and invested in those to scale them up. We uh, demonstrated that these initiatives were part of a process we were already engaged in and had buy-in around. And then areas where we need to make um, additional gains. I would say, for example, around high impact practices or around uh, affordable learning, we had had sort of small pockets of activity that had been supported sometimes by, by small internal grants or by external grants or just passion of a particular faculty member. And so we've provided some incentives for departments to take that on and implement it across all sections of a particular course or implement it as a practice within a department where there's whole department buy-in and trying to scale from there. You don't go from zero to 90 overnight, um, especially when you have limited resources. So I would say aligning people's work so it's in concert and we create synergy instead of stepping on each other's toes and then trying to provide incentives to take things to the next step. Is it an activity to a whole course? Is it um, you know, scattered high impact practices in a department to identify what's the, the signature experience for a degree program and, and really work on expanding that, starting wherever people are, and that's you know, at different levels in the institution, but we're building momentum um, bit by bit across, across the whole university. So that, that's been our strategy. One of the things I heard early on, and was just, <laughs> I was just I was just enthralled by as you were describing it, but the the student piece is that you know the students are being impacted, and you involve them in the process. And and, and how did you how did you put that in a message that they could understand or embrace? So I, I think some of it is you know we've made heavy use of peer mentors and um, talking with them uh, about and optimizing those roles. So you have groups of student leaders. Um, one of the areas I think we still have to do a lot of work, it takes constant communication to help everybody see how all the pieces fit together. But um, we, you know, reorienting our um, peer advisors in um, academic advising, uh, getting them to work in concert with our orientation leaders 
taking our orientation leaders and developing them into um, leaders that help students through their first semester or through their first year. Really aligning great creative ideas coming out of different units um, and, and working with their training, working with their leadership so that we were uh, doing consistent messaging. And I think that that helps with the students. It also helps with faculty and staff to align those things. Such an effective uh, strategy that the peer mentor piece is, is to get champions in, in populations that can help drive that change. That, that was a great and effective use of that concept. Ramon, let's turn it over to you for momentum. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, I agree. One of the challenges, um, it's not much more than I could add uh, than what my colleagues have said. Um, you know, water conforms to its container. Uh, Dr. Denley, Chancellor Wrigley, and uh, University System of Georgia uh, has set up a, the momentum approach so that, um, you know, we definitely have a container that we can then pour into. And what I always try to do is once we understand that the, what that container is, try to communicate efficiently and effectively to ensure that everybody understands what's being put into that container and how their individual part contributes to the whole. Then once we see holistic results or campus-wide results, then we go out and make sure we tell our story. Because at the end of the day, as people put into the container, they want to be able to effectively take out. And so when you can come back and talk about how your uh, graduation rates have increased, how your retention rates continue to stay high, how your enrollment increases, how your students are performing better in classes, these are the types of things that get people motivated and it creates, uh, I saw Dr. Denley join and he was on campus one time and, and I talked about the mo. Well, it creates the mo and the momentum. And as soon as you get that mo going and the momentum going, you keep progressing and progressing and progressing. And next thing you know, you've moved everybody across the finish line. So effective use of story and telling people where, where, you're, where you're going with what you're doing, it sounds like. Johnny, can you, you talk a little bit about momentum? Sure, um, I, I don't take a lot of credit for it. Um, because I have such a great team of, uh, of AVPs and deans and chairs and faculty and staff who bought into it. You know, the, the thing about Momentum was we all wanted to do exactly what Momentum set out to do. We all wanted to do that. We were all doing it in some form or fashion, but we weren't, we weren't as intentional about it as the Momentum uh, year and Momentum approached uh, uh, gave us that container, as Ramon said, to, to, to put it into. So it created, it gave us this intentional moment to be creative, right? An intentional period. And so now we have the, the, the impetus to do it in a different way because it is more of a part of our work. So we grabbed onto it. Our folks were very creative um, and, and we listened to that creativity and we let people work in their strengths. We didn't try to tell someone that you have to fit in this particular spot. This is the work you have to do. If it didn't fit them very well, we let people work in their strengths and be creative. And the wonderful thing that come out of that was huge ideas that, that, that impacted student success. And, and we got a lot of buy-in very quickly on the momentum year and even the momentum approach. Um, we had already moved into the momentum approach phase before we, that word became our buzzword um, in the system. And, and so it's because we had good folks just bought into the idea of caring for students. Um, it, and it was, it was easy. And there was, there was a lot of work. There was, uh, you know, there was some anxiety at the beginning of how, we, how do we pull this off? There was concern, questions about resources, all of those things that everyone dealt with. But, but there was buy-in when you get down to the, to the base of it, we all really wanted to do this anyways. We were doing this, the whole goal of what we do at colleges and universities is, is give these students the momentum for their life and career. And so uh, I give my team a lot of credit for it. I, I didn't, I was not the driving factor in this. It was a collective work. So some, some emerging themes I think that's coming from all of you is one is how important it is for everybody to participate in this initiative. 
Um, but the second is it, that it was a higher aspiration that people could embrace across the board um, and, and stay um, involved in as well. They didn't fall by the wayside as you did it. So we're gonna slightly shift gears. We're actually gonna drill down to some of what you've already talked about. And we are really, as a society, um, organizations very task focused, but to get things done, we do that through relationships. Um, we establish relationships and foster those relationships. But we also need to see the relationship between ideas and departments and, and um, different products. And so if you could tell me how you establish and strengthen relationships across your institution. And I'm gonna go back to you again, Johnny. One of the things that we're very intentional about when we're putting together a, a committee or a task force or whatever you wanna call it, um, that we have broad base um, uh, a broad base of, of participants and committee members. We don't simply limit something to an individual department or, or a division. And, and we recognize the input that, that enrollment management has in initiatives and, and student success areas and the academics, along with business affairs, the whole campus to try to make sure that we're not functioning in silos. So we're very intentional about those pieces of having committees and task force that have broad, broad membership. And that, that matters because then you hear everyone's voice um, across the campus and it's different perspectives, right? Because a, a faculty member has the perspective from the classroom that, that there, we may drive an idea that helps academic affairs, but that has an impact on enrollment management and recruiting and and enrollment management has a diff, comes at it a different perspective and we can get to a better ground together. What I tell my folks all the time is, you know, when you think about the collective brain power on this campus at any given moment in any given meeting, it is enormous. The amount of training and experience and knowledge and critical thinking skills that is brought to a meeting, it, it can, can tackle almost any problem we have. What we should do always is have that broad buy-in across all sectors of the campus so that we take advantage of that shared, uh, that, that collective experience and knowledge to where we can tackle problems, tackle challenges, and be creative and come up with ideas. So that's one of the ways that we really try to work across the entire campus to get, it gets buy-in, but it also gives us some of the best ideas you've, you've seen, and they come out of sometimes car rides back from other meetings or from lunch pre-pandemic, right? Um, and, and other times, at, right after a meeting, someone saying, hey, let's talk about this. I had this idea during the meeting and it's a group that gets together that's diverse and that, that really matters. So, in, so inclusion of, of various parties strengthens the relationships, but also gives you uh, more ideas um, of depth, it sounds like as well. It does. And, and it, it, it's what Deborah said earlier, people want to know that they're being heard and that they are a part of the, the mission. And there's, there's value in me micromanaging it and me making the decisions alone. We get so much better results, so many more results that are effective and impactful if we are including a diverse group of, of minds and thoughts and experiences. Thanks so much. Ramon, can you talk about relationships, how you've established them and strengthened them? So here in my university, one of the things I pride myself on, I think I know just about every name of every employee that's here. Um, not only do I know the employee's name, in many instances, unless they're just tucked away in an office in a cubicle, um, I actually know something about them. Um, how do I know that? Well, what happens is I'll eat my lunch real quick and then I'll go out on campus and try to walk six or 7,000 steps, just going in different nooks and crannies. And, and, and what that does for me, number one, it, it, it uh, lets me do something else I like to do with the people here. Um, people from Fort Valley will tell you that I enjoy eating pizza. And we can have pizza with the provost any day that ends in Y and twice on Sundays, okay? So whether you're from the facilities team to the students, to the faculty, if you wanna have some pizza, all you have to do is call me. 
and we're going to have some pizza. And But having those kinds of relationships, and I'll be honest with you, I even peruse social media first thing in the morning to see whose birthday it is. Uh, Facebook tells you everything. And if I know it's your birthday, matter of fact, we got a wildcat on here that her birthday was yesterday, ironically. Um, Facebook told me, and so I made sure to wish her a happy birthday. And so when you start to know who people are and what makes them tick, you can start to accent their tick with your talk. And when you understand who people are and how they fit as part of the whole, you can start to help put the pieces together because they feel like they belong as a part of the puzzle as opposed to, you know, being an outsider. And then you get the points where you build organic relationships. For instance, yesterday, you know, I'm looking at my colleague Shadron. I have a, a colleague here that I think is doing phenomenal work, ready to go to that next level. So it was my honor to write a letter of recommendation for that colleague to get a doctorate at North Georgia. And I say that to say the only reason that person felt comfortable enough coming to me, the only reason I feel comfortable enough even saying it to my colleague or colleagues is because I know that person. I know who they are. I know what they can do. And I know the sky's the limit. And so the more you can understand who a person is, the more you can appreciate them for who they are, and even embrace who they're not, then you're better positioned to lead them, I believe, to the next level. I, I get such a strong sense from you, not only, not only this time, but last time you, you talked about how much you invest in spending time with people and really truly getting to know them on a genuine level. What I hear from a lot of leaders, um, and, and I think some of it's perceptual, but some of it's, it's real, is they may not have the time to do that or they struggle with doing that. Do you have any ideas on, on how people can get out and spend time with their people? Yeah, so uh, I think in a, uh, uh, one of my last responses, I talked about prioritization. Um, we have to figure out how to do the things that's important to us. And the other thing is, I think you really have to look at uh, attempting to kill multiple birds with one stone. For instance, I want to get some exercise at lunch, so I eat lunch real quick and then go out on campus. That gives me an opportunity to interact with whoever I see, and as long as I take different routes, then I see different people. If I go different times, again, you see different people. So I think we have to do things to fit things in, utilizing our commute time, um, you know, some of the different downtimes that you can create um, with focus time on your schedule and stuff. I just think you have to make time for the things that you want to do. And then once you make that time, you'll start to see that it becomes organic. When it becomes organic, it's not something you do, it's something you enjoy. Well said, thank you. Children, can you talk about relationships? Yes, yeah, in listening to my colleagues, I'm hearing some of the same, um, same things that are important to me. And, you know, as Johnny talked about having a, a wide array of folks invested in different task forces, that you need to bring different bodies, different perspectives together around decisions. And, you know, in hearing Ramon talk about the importance of knowing people in that personal relationship, um, I, I, I guess I was thinking of it in terms of framing it's the, the formal and the informal aspects that really build the relationship and I think give you a greater sense of, of where people are, what their issues are, and how to move that, how to move things forward. So I've done things like um, to break through silos, add members from enrollment management or other areas to my provost council so that they can hear the discussions and we benefit from their perspective. And my colleagues in enrollment management, student affairs have done the same thing, invited academic affairs representatives to participate regularly in their meetings, not just as a guest. So we get some of that cross fertilization. And then we have certain groups that we've combined and created that bring all of us together. But, you know, I think about with my, say with my direct reports or with different areas, 
We have councils that bring all of us together, but the individual touch points with them are very important also. Even if there's no set agenda, no crisis, no decision to be made, we have a set aside time to make sure that there's an opportunity just to discuss broadly um, what they're dreaming, what they're thinking, what they're hearing in their units. Um, you know, so, so it gives us a little more time to be creative and gives me a greater sense of what's going on in their, their, their area that I may you know, need to go back to them in several months. Uh, but because of that conversation, I'm aware of something that could be a factor in decision making. Um, the same thing with uh, leaders across campus. Uh, we have our, our councils and our regular meetings. We also meet formally one-on-one, -on -one, but then it's the let's go grab a drink after work and just catch up with each other, or you know, let's have lunch together, or let's go on a walk together. Um, informal opportunities. Uh, I heard very clearly from the faculty that while you know town halls were great and coming to faculty senate was great that informal communication was important too. So I started scheduling sort of chat times on each of our five campuses where I would just go to campus and hang out in the coffee shop for two hours and advertise that to all of the faculty and staff and say, anybody wanna come by and chat with the provost, I'm gonna be in the coffee shop on this day, uh, come by and see me. And it, and it gave an informal way for people to come by and you know, talk about what was on their heart or what they were concerned about or ask questions that they might not ask in a formal forum. So that combination of formal and informal and, and being intentional about both pieces, I think is really important in building relationships. Such, such creativity. Um, one of the things you talked about was bringing in people, breaking down those silos, you know, the in, introduction of, of a broadening of perspectives. I'm sure at times you've had some resistance to that. If so, how do you, how do you go, how do you get through that? Um, so some of it, I think, is, is highlighting the contributions that, um, having that person in the discussion makes. And I would say sometimes I've encountered um, a, another piece around relationships is when you ask people to participate in something or you ask people to provide data, they wanna know what happens, what impact that had on decision-making, that ability to kind of close the loop and go back and tell them, you know, because of your participation, because of this piece of data, we were able to use that in informing this decision and now I'm communicating that decision back to you or I'm communicating the next step back to you. So that, that closing the loop, um, I think is important so that people feel one, their presence and their contribution when they're maybe not normally part of that group is important. And the members of the group also see how bringing in that extra voice or, or bringing in that piece of data was important to your deliberations. So that, that piece of closing the loop, I think is an important um, thing to do. That is such an effective leadership technique is to provide meaning for people about their work, to know that they actually contributed and how they contributed and how it related to the bigger picture. Thank you. Deborah, can you can you talk about establishing and strengthening relationships? I uh, echo everything that's been said. Chadron did a good job of summary, summarizing Ramon and, and Johnny, um, and and I have some of your um, leadership techniques as well in terms of strengthening relationships. I think for me the key becomes being willing to start over with people. You know, it, it is a challenging time to be in a leadership uh, position. Uh, there's so many things happening all at the, the same time, but starting over uh, is a technique that I've used with students in the, in the classroom. You know, it may be that we have a difficult situation or difficult conversation or experience today. I don't hold grudges or take it into the, the next day. Uh, I also benefit from knowing the faculty, having been here for such a long period of time. I don't think there's anyone on our faculty who wouldn't feel comfortable either coming to see me as people sometimes do or calling me or emailing me uh, to discuss an issue. Uh, so there's a value in that. I also work diligently to try to create an environment where people feel that they can communicate freely. Um, and 
communication is key as well as transparency as much as issues allow so that you know it's not just that a mandating a decision or that is top down you know they're getting the reason behind doing it as well as much as possible so I, I love this idea of the fresh slate that basically we're not carrying through any baggage or anything into the next interaction. Um, th can you talk a little bit more about transparency? Because people struggle a lot with that word. I think we, we kind of know what it is on the surface, but then operationalizing it or making it actually work. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, one example that goes back to um, when we took COVID uh, is the mask mandate. You know, initially we weren't wearing masks and then we, you know, received the um, instructions that we would all wear masks inside buildings and outside if we were in, in smaller groups. So there was some concern about whether or not students would be willing to, to wear a mask and what faculty would do if they didn't wear them and with faculty as well. So you know, after consulting with our, our team, uh, sending out a message to faculty, basically reminding people that, um, there are already policies in place to address students who are not complying. And there's a great deal of concern about that. And it didn't uh, happen, actually. I mean, we didn't have any problems with students not wearing the, the mask. But communicating with uh, student, student life, uh, student affairs, coming up with policies, and then sending those policies out from the faculty and then receiving their, their responses. You know, so kind of being, this is why we're doing different things. The withdrawal policy uh, is the same thing. We, we received feedback from students and from some faculty who wanted to know why we didn't extend the deadline for students to withdraw, given everything that was happening with, with the virus. Uh, but we didn't because we wanted students to stay on track, even in the midst of everything that's going on. So just kind of, again, communicating and being clear about why policies are, why things are being done in the way that they are. Thank you. The, ne the next few questions you guys have kind of touched upon, but hopefully we can again go a little bit deeper, but leadership, change, momentum are all collective endeavors. Um, so the first question is, what are the strategies you use to gather input from key stakeholders? And those can be people on the front line or they can be your end users, their students or their families. Um, and we'll go ahead and start off with you, Ramon. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, it, it, first remembering why you were blessed with two ears and only one mouth, making sure that you listen twice as much as you speak, trying to make sure that you cast a broad net so that you can get a lot of feedback. Do not be dismissive of where feedback may come. I remember when I first went to work, my grandmother told me to make sure I know the most important person on campus. My grandmother never went past probably the fourth grade or so. And I said, well, who is that, Granny? Is that the, the president? She looked at me and said, no, it's the person who takes out the trash because they know where everything is. And so just making sure that we do not let our titles and let the number of letters that we have behind our names um, dictate who can say or what they are allowed to say, uh, trying to be open, but also having the ability to, to discern between what you need to act or react to and what you need to just tuck back for later times. Um, and so, but, but again, if you're out there, you're approachable, people will tell you things, probably half of them you do not want to know, but they'll tell you and you can make the most of it. And, and, and work through that. Thank you so much. That accessibility is, is really important. Johnny, how about you in relation to um, getting input from key stakeholders? Yeah, it's, it, you know, it, it, we, have, we have so many people on our campus that are involved in and in have uh, good ideas and, and um, are invested in what we're doing for students. And so, you know, it, it requires, I think, a multifaceted approach. One of the things that that I did early on, I came here in January of 2019, is, is I started going and meeting with individual departments and, and offered the opportunity to meet with individual faculty just so that they had time to talk to me in, in uh, you know, having the practice of walking around campus, going and eating in the dining hall, showing up to events. Um, 
asking to come to department level meetings or school meetings um, just to be available and answer questions without an agenda uh, from myself just being there. Um, those are important, but also employing employing the leaders that that I have working with me, employing my deans and chairs to also then go gain that information and knowledge and listen and, and bring it back as well. Um, and I think that that the the staff piece provides an angle of the staff are able to give me the interpretation from the staff perspective of students and SGA and, and getting feedback from them. I, all of that collectively we use so that we hear from everyone. And you have to be, we said this multiple times, we all have it, you have to be intentional about that and, and, and very transparent. Um, and you're gonna hear stuff you don't like. You may hear stuff said about you you don't like, that's okay. Um, there's, pro there's probably some truth to it at some point. There, there may not be, it doesn't matter, let's move forward. But let's listen together and, and listen, listen, listen. And the other part is if you ask people's advice, you got to be willing to take it. You can't just constantly ask people's advice and never use any of it. You can't be the one who is the keeper of, of, of all the knowledge and control and think that you have all the right answers. You take the ideas that people give you and run with it and let other people run with it when they have the ideas. And so I think that that gives this strong communication when you just keep it open and transparent. And in times like this, it's a little more difficult because we don't have those serendipitous moments. So because not as many people may be on campus. So you don't see them walking over to your meeting in the registrar's office. You don't run into somebody from financial aid necessarily or from advising. You don't have those serendipitous moments to have that communication. So you, it, it requires more intentionality, I think to create those kinds of moments. So it sounds like engaging with people in their workplace, but also getting your leaders to do the same thing. And then, then taking the information that you get and doing something with it, responding to it. That's very, very important. Let everyone be a part of the communication process. It's not just your responsibility. Empowerment, great. Deborah, you talk a little bit about uh, your your relationships with key stakeholders? Um, intentionality, as Johnny mentioned, I, I think is essential. And it being open to taking ideas and um, hearing from other people, that consistency there in terms of uh, communication. We meet regularly uh, with all kinds of um, groups on, on campus, not just with uh, faculty, but with also students. Uh, I mentioned our weekly enrollment task force meetings earlier and all the different stakeholders that are included in that that group. We talk about enrollment, but sometimes we talk about other things as, as well, other pertinent issues um, to which we all need to have a voice in and, and contribute. So I think just that ongoing uh, communication and being open to the input and then having people see something come about as a result of it, to have it um, realized in, in some way. Uh, one example that I can think of uh, involves communication with the advisors when we were all um, sent home back in, in March. Uh, you know, we had to come up with a, a plan so that students could still get in touch with their uh, advisors. So the advisors were included in that meeting with, when the communication plan was being developed. So I think making sure that uh, the stakeholders or the people who are going to be directly affected have a voice in the decision and some input. So this, this reminds me of what you said earlier, and um, I think it also speaks to what, what Johnny was talking about. How do you prepare yourself to be truly objective, to be open to that input that you're getting in advance or ongoingly? I think the, the preparation becomes more, more personal in terms of uh, reminding myself that it's not about me you know, so, you know, whatever the, the issue or the, the problem is, I want to get that that resolved um, so I can set aside my own personal feelings and, and then just accept whatever input is going to address the issue in the most effective way. That that, that ultimately has to be the goal. Children, can you talk a little bit about how you get input from those stakeholders? I think you know the the ways in which um, everybody's already talked about 
sort of using your structures, your, your governance structures, your groups to gather input, using all levels to gather input are important. Um, I really liked Deborah's point about making sure that the, the end users or the people who are engaged in the work have a voice in how you're going to address um, solving the problem. Uh, so yes, we do all of those things. Um, one of the things that we have learned through COVID though, uh, I think there are communication strategies that we have developed because the time frame for decision-making was condensed in many cases. And so um, the, the ability to gather input in our normal mechanisms where you have a, a group that meets maybe every other week or once a month, that really didn't function well. And so we used some new mechanisms to gather input. And one of the things that I'm reflecting a lot on now is how do I take those, those practices that were good, that worked well in the crisis situation, how do I make them part of our norm? And so there were, there were situations, I, I, I like to think of it as just-in-time communication. We would you know, survey the students about a particular issue and get their feedback so we could gauge the scope of the problem and try to respond, um, particularly around access to technology. That was a survey we did very early on. Um, we've surveyed faculty and students at multiple points about their experiences as we transitioned um, to totally online in our, our distance delivery in the spring, online in the summer, reflections on the fall, and used that information to help shape conversations. Um, moving town halls to a virtual medium and collecting questions in advance has given us a much higher engagement than we ever had in face-to-face -face town halls, much more robust questions being asked. And, and that has helped us identify where, where people have worries, where there's still issues or where communication hasn't been clear or hasn't been repeated enough. And so we've been able to adjust in, in that way. And so I'm thinking about the, you know, the things that have worked well, some of the, the frequency with which types of, of input is gathered and um, how to carry those lessons learned forward to improve what we're doing. This is such an important point that people are coming to realize um, is to actually reframe um, this virtual communication. It's, it's in a lot of cases has given voice to people that didn't previously have voice or input. So um, rather than thinking of it as, a, as a, a drag on what we're doing, it's actually an opportunity in some way. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to combine the next two questions because I really want to get to the last two questions. They're just so important, I think. So the, the next two questions are, you know, how do you set priorities? How do you share understanding of those priorities? And how do you align everybody towards those priorities? And um, I'm going to go back to you, Shodron, on that. Well, I think... Um having conversations about what your goals are strategically, um, the what you want to achieve, the why that you're doing something, um, the pressures in, in, and data points informing that decision. If you have transparency in, in conversations around the what the issues are, what the, the pressure points are, the why it's important and solicit input uh, into the decision making, while while the decision may not, you know, everybody might not agree with the decision, but at least they understand how you got there. And I think that that uh, that level of transparency does a lot to um, help people understand the priorities. And if you can be very clear about priorities, um, I'll, I'll give a simple example from a couple of years ago where the, the president had decided that we would dedicate a certain amount of funding in our budget for that year to equity adjustments. And so um, not everyone got an equity adjustment. And you know there were some faculty who were upset about that. And the faculty senate wanted to know, you know, well, so how were these decisions made? Was it completely arbitrary? And, and I was able to point back to a salary study that they had done and recommendations that had come out of a task force and say, okay, here were the rec recommendations from the task force. This is how we implemented it. We updated the data on this date. This is why these decisions were made. 
And, and we had a limited amount of funds, but I was able to point to a clear reasoning that aligned with previous efforts or um, you know, strategies and values that were in place. And I think that that helped people understand the prioritization. Um, the, the same thing in how talking with the deans about where specific uh, faculty lines will be allocated, or if we're discussing um, a, you know, a program on a specific campus, uh, everybody might not get what they want, but at least they understand the factors that have gone into setting these priorities and that they're aligned with the strategic direction that we've agreed upon. And um, just, a, again, kind of closing that loop of communication on, I sought your input, and, and or here's the data, and here's how it's being used to inform these decisions. I think that's a key piece. Yeah, that why, that background, that context, so, so helpful. Deborah, can, can you tell me a little bit about uh, priorities and shared understanding and alignment? Um, in terms of setting priorities, I think it depends upon whatever the, uh, the issue is. So is it, I think the determination first has to be made, is it something that has to be addressed right now or something that we can do later? So that becomes a first step for me. Um, in terms of aligning it and making sure we're going in the same direction. I always go back to our uh, mission, the institution's mission and our core values and using those as the framework and the foundation for all of these uh, decisions, you know, that's, that's a common starting point for us, reminding people that um, if it's a huge issue, our mission and core values haven't changed even, no matter what the issue is. Uh, I think back to during our convocation, I shared with the faculty at our division meeting for academic affairs that I have this fear of driving over large bridges, huge bridges. Um, so my uh, sister and mom and I were coming back from Jacksonville and driving to Jekyll Island and I saw this huge bridge in the distance, uh, th not thinking that I would eventually be driving over it. Uh, and before I knew it, I was at the entrance to the bridge. Uh, and I gasped, I guess, without realizing when my sister was reading uh, next to me and <clears throat> she looked up and simply said, the road is still the same. You know, and just those words, uh, the road is still the same, calm my fears immediately. Uh, and I think uh, the same has to be true for us, especially leading in, in this time. There are priorities, there are decisions that have to be made, but our core values, our institutional mission, none of that has changed in, in light of all of that. You know, so again, kind of focusing on the issue, having clear expectations, uh, clear guidelines, communicating as, as much as possible and maintaining as much transparency as possible, kind of keeping things in, in perspective. What a great story about leader vulnerability and relating back to, to what you're doing. And um, you know, there's this common organization, and you both described this, there's a common organizational development principle that when you're doing something that's not aligned with your values and mission, you're probably not so healthy organizationally. And so you guys are, are getting back to the core of what you need to do. Johnny, setting, setting priorities and, and uh, sharing those priorities and aligning. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's busy. Boy, it's been, it feels like it's been 10 years in the last year for all of us with, with busyness. I, I talked about this this morning. Um, uh, with with my president, uh, you know, we talked about that. You know, typically, there's this rhythm in in academics that we go through of a lot going on. We have a little bit of a lull, and then there's some more initiatives and things that are due and midterm grades. And you go through these cycles in a semester, and we really haven't had those cycles this last year um, because in those valleys where we might have a lull to catch up on some of the just work stuff, worker bee stuff you have to do, that maybe this priority took took precedence over, those are now filled with other priorities. So it's more like a, st a straight road um, or an incline, whichever way you wanna look at it. Uh, but so so it's it's taking the same approaches that, that my peers have just mentioned of sticking to mission, um, sticking to who you are and doing what you're supposed to do. Um, and, and we, from, from the president through everyone, we always ask the question here, how is this going to impact student success? How is this taking care of every student every time? And, and do we need to do, there's some things you do that you can't see the direct line to student success, but 
and you still do them, right? And they're important things to do. But most of the stuff that we do, we want to drive through student success. So we try to prioritize it on that level. How is this going to impact student success? Someone might say, as Shadron mentioned, the, the equity adjustments for, for salaries, that that doesn't impact student success. Oh, yes, it does. Because if faculty do not feel valued and staff do not feel valued in the work that they're doing, you're going to lose people to other places where they will feel valued. And, and then you have high turnover, you don't have the consistency, but when you value people, they put more care into their work that impacts student success. And so we, we try to take that focus on our priorities and, and, and making sure that we're always doing what has to be done right now and being visionary about what we can plan for and getting that buy-in to make sure that everyone understands why we're doing it. And, and one final piece is, you just got to be comfortable that not everybody's going to be happy and it's okay that that somebody doesn't like your decision that you made. Um, I had the, I learned that the hard way early in leadership that I couldn't make everybody happy and and I didn't need to own that um, that that everyone had to be happy. I had to be comfortable with the fact that sometimes people won't be happy but if you're transparent and honest and forthright of why you did it, you can move forward together as long as you've had that, a, a relationship there. That uh, thematically, again, that connection, that intentionality just keeps bringing through from all of you. Ramon, um, give us your take on priorities. Yeah, Chuck, and to be quite honest with you, if you would have asked me this question this time last year, I would have given you a whole totally different answer. But as we look and we just eclipsed the 500,000 mark in terms of people being taken as a result of the COVID virus, one of the things I've learned in this past year is it's not that serious. And please do not take yourself that serious. And so when you think about prioritization, my whole thing um, and I see a couple of my colleagues on here, they know that I like to end my day with the inbox that is empty, all messages returned, everything. I, I like to have quick fixes that you can fix within 48 hours. And I, as we move forward, I like to do things within two weeks. But then you just realize, just relax. Take the things that you have to do to keep the lights on for that day, but then also be flexible enough and nimble enough to take on the challenges that may come your way. And I think when you start doing that, then it opens up time for communication. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the reasons I believe we've been as successful as we have during the pandemic is that Tuesday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., the deans and I, we meet for an hour. We talk about the highs, lows, and everything in between. So we take that hour, or it's four hours, uh, for that week. And I kid you not, we probably do not email, call, or text each other two more times a day on average for the rest of the week. Because we come in, we get on the same page, we understand where the challenges are, We've identified some of the opportunities so they can go back and prioritize how they're going to address things, what they're going to put off till tomorrow or what they put off till tomorrow has now become today. We go through that, but then we free ourselves up to be creative, innovative, and uh, be able to get things accomplished. And so, you know, again, this time last year, I would have given you another answer. And I think that's the other thing I know. Um, Johnny had mentioned, you know, somebody's not going to like something you do. Um, and, and then Deborah mentioned, you know, she does not hold grudges or anything. One of the big things of any leader is you have to realize that you cannot be the same leader that you were a year ago that you are today if you plan to continue to be effective. Uh, music to my ears. So this, this point about relaxing, we play better, we do better when we're relaxed, right? We're not, we're not performing out of fear. And so that, and again, that creativity shines forth. 
but but this leadership development piece being iterative that it's constantly evolving and we need to continue to invest is is, is, a, is a great takeaway for everyone as well thank you um so we're in the home stretch it's got two more to go here and um i'm gonna start off with you deborah and can you talk a little bit about how you develop leadership and the ability to manage change in those who work for you or around you um I think the key is, again, making sure that um, expectations and guidelines are, are clear for people. Um, trying to create an environment where people can advance from one, one stage to, to another. I, I'll go back to an administrative role I had as um, a dean and a department chair. You know, I always try to make sure that there were Plate ways for faculty to contribute, to make meaningful contributions in the areas where they were going to be evaluated. And I think that's still true of the, the provost's office. You know, even if it meant establishing uh, committees or, or groups so that when it came time to come up for tenure or for promotion, that they were ready and that it happened over a period of, of time. Um, part of my administrative philosophy is just trusting people, uh, trusting the faculty, trusting them to to the extent if they say they're offering their classes 51% of the time in the hybrid face-to-face, -face, they are meeting at those times. Um, trusting and then, of course, verifying it as needed. But uh, again, kind of creating that environment where people can thrive and, and grow. So the, the bit hardest part of my job, I think, is making sure that other people are able to do theirs to and to do theirs effectively. Yeah, trust is such an important part of leadership. Thank you. Children, how, how about you? How do you develop your leaders and, and their ability to meet change? Well, I, I think back to some of what Johnny said at the very beginning about the, the people, the mentors that allowed him opportunities to, to sort of shadow and attend as a participant or to try on different roles. And um, I do that very intentionally uh, as a as my best way of thinking creatively is to sit with a small group of people or a trusted person and sort of talk through an issue out loud and everything's free game, throw all ideas on the table and we you know, discuss the pros and cons. And so for you know, people who, um, that I'm working intently with, cultivating their leadership skills, knowing that they have aspirational goals. Uh, I've involved more people in those kinds of discussions um, in, in small groups. And that helps me make better decisions because I have their varying perspectives and it helps them work through the process of how you come to a decision. And, and so it's productive for both of us. And um, you know, there are people whose opinions I greatly respect. It's just providing them with insight into maybe areas of operation that they previously haven't been involved in. And so now they, they get to participate in some of that or try that on. And, and then likewise, I, I created a provost faculty fellows uh, position, two of them in fact, it's a small stipend and a course release for um, a faculty member to apply to, to come in and take on a particular project that a need that we may have in the provost office that kind of keeps being pushed to the back burner perhaps, be it a, a project or a research issue, um, help implementing something or designing a structure. So pick a project that aligns with their interests and empower them to work on that and empower them to attend meetings they would not, you know, provost council, dean's council for insight and how things work at that structure. And then I would also say, as people have identified, say, challenges during the pandemic and, and they've identified a, a, a pinch point or an issue, to empower them to come up with a solution and try it as a pilot and for it to be okay to fail, that it's worth trying something and failing as opposed to not trying at all. And so it becomes an iterative, iterative process. And we look at what worked well and what didn't and what resources were needed and why it may or may not have worked. And we adjust and continue that, that process. So that those are sort of three areas that I would say that I'll focus on developing leadership and adaptability. So 
you you have an awareness of what they're they're striving for or, or their their aims, um, and then you provide them opportunities, and then you adapt accordingly. Is what I hear. Mm -hmm. okay. Ramon, can you talk about leadership development and uh, instilling the ability to meet change? Yeah, and, and so Deborah mentioned something earlier about um, you know just trust. And one of the things that we talked about here at Fort Valley was we developed plans, you know, we went through and everything. And at the end of the day, our, our model, or our theme was just trust the plan. Just trust the plan. It's almost like when we're riding down the street and, and we're following the instructions and we should be listening to GPS, but we decide that we have our own internal compass and when we go off of the beaten path, then we usually need to be corrected if we would have just trusted the plan. And I think the collaboration in development of the plan, the common understanding of the plan, and then getting out of the way, you know, letting people trust the plan, do what they need to do. They may not do it how you want it done but they're still getting it. And at the end of the day, there's no difference between half a dozen and six. But I think then what happens is when you're trusting the plan and you can see those individuals or those visionaries that can uh, internalize it and, and put an accent on it or elevate things, then you start to find your real talent. And that's where you then go and meet that talent where they are and start positioning them without their knowledge to go places they never dreamed of going. And so when you identify who a person is, what they do, then you start saying little things like, well, have you thought about going to this professional development? Or uh, what do you think if I nominate you for this or nominate you for that? Or uh, what do you think about getting a doctorate? Then you start to shape and mold people to where they feel comfortable coming to you saying, you know, I want to do this. I want to be this. How do I do that? Will you help me? And then that's the best of all worlds because that individual has identified within him or herself that they want to go to the next level, but then they also respect you enough to appreciate where you have been or where you are and what you can do to help them go to the next level. Oh put a lot of front end work on the plan and then kind of release the rain, reins a little bit and let the plan go forward to help guide people. Johnny, can you, can you talk briefly about leadership development and, and instilling the ability to make change? Sure, I'll, I'll just build off of one of the things that Ramon mentioned was those little things that you say, you know, I would have not gone to grad school if Ken McGill walking down the hall at Georgia College hadn't said, you're smart enough to get a PhD. I never thought I was. Um, a friend of mine, Terry Cross, as a freshman in a theology class, speaks up to the professor and says, what makes you the expert on this just because you wrote a book? And the professor said back to him, Terry, when you write your books, you can speak as the expert then and answer that question. Now, Terry says that moment told him he could be an author. It's those little moments where we say, have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? That really kind of shape and bring people along to the idea that they can grow and improve and have leadership ability. And so, you know, uh, mimicking everything that everyone has talked about, I do all of that. And then I'm very intentional with those little comments that matter and congratulating people on a job well done and say, you'd led there, pointing out when they were leaders. A lot of times people don't even know they were leading. But that was, that was great leadership when you spoke up at that committee and said that and you guided the conversation. That way you didn't even realize you were doing it. But, but recognizing that when people lead, it begins that process early on in their careers to see that they can be leaders. And then just intentionally making those steps to develop their career and give them opportunity. Such an important point. As leaders, we, we, get, we get to change somebody's life. Um, we do it right. And we get the reward of that. But hopefully they're going to take that and give it to somebody else in turn. So it's, it's just thank you for that. So last question. Um, this is for the audience. I want to impress. I think this is a very important question, but I get a lot of confirm, confirmation bias to tell me it's an important question. Um, Jonathan and I were talking a little bit about this. And so 
I interviewed a lot of people last year in and out of the education industry, and they couldn't wait to get back to the status quo of things. But as we go along, people are understanding that we are going to come out of this pandemic and that we may need to do things a little bit differently. Um, and we have some lessons to take with us. So, so Johnny, could you talk a little bit about what do you think leadership looks like on the other side of the pandemic? I have no idea, um, honestly. I mean, <laughs> good, good, good answer. <laughs> we're going to keep doing the things that we're all talking about doing because that's leadership. But I think we're going to have to be agile and adjust the modalities that we in which we deliver them and shift into some areas that maybe we didn't make as high a level of priority as important. You know, we we don't have the the serendipitous moments of walking by and seeing through the window of someone's office door that they were struggling because you can read their body language now because we just don't have that kind of opportunity during this time. Is that going to return after the pandemic? I don't know. But just being very intentional about trying to, to connect with people is going to, I know is going to shift. Um, I talked with my president about it. She's really good at, at going and seeing people and taking the time across campus about it. And, and that's one of the things we recognize is that we have to, we, we're gonna have to be intentional, continue to be intentional with watching for people and seeing when we need to intervene as a leader to maybe coach them up, encourage them or help them in, in that time uh, that they're struggling. And so that's one thing that I, that I recognize, but the rest of it, I just, I think this is going to be a shifting landscape for us continually for the next several years as teams has changed things. We all realize we can do teams in zoom now and it actually works. Um, it, it, so it's going to continue to shift. And I think we just have to be agile and shift with it. Thank you. Ramon. Yeah, so I think we're going to emerge from this as individuals who have better understanding, more compassion, and more appreciation of the variety of ways that people can get jobs accomplished. I say that because I never would have believed that a collection of people could telework and do it efficiently and effectively. I say that because I believe now when they get long, it's a challenge, but I believe that the meetings by Zoom and team are more direct to the point. You cut out a lot of the pontification. Uh, people are usually on time. Uh, you have your goals, you get in, you get out. I believe that we're going to be a more efficient person or a efficient workforce. Um, but then I also believe that unfortunately, it's going to be more and more challenging for us to establish the healthy boundaries that are necessary to be an effective employee and then also a good person holistically. Thank you. Children, post-pandemic leadership. Uh, lessons that I think I will take away. Um, some things have just been reinforced. Uh, the importance of communication, 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 communication. Um, getting input uh, for decision-making that collective decisions or, or broad-based decisions tend to be better. That we've got to build in flexibility and kind of what Ramon was saying about, you know, there, there are different ways of, of doing things and how to balance who you are as a whole person and who you are as an employee or a student or, or a provost. Um, I don't, I, I think this is reinforced for us that one size does not fit all. And if we're to continue in our mission uh, and be effective in serving our students and also taking care of our, our our staff and our employees, we've got to recognize that one size does not fit all. And so an analogy that I often use in talking about structures, policies, and that kind of stuff with, with the deans is I don't want to put everybody in the same lane because you're all, you're moving at different paces. You have different constraints. You have different, you know, maybe you're driving an 18 wheeler, maybe you're drive, driving a Volkswagen, 
but we need guardrails on the highway that give us general guidelines. And, and our pace within that or the particular lane we're in, there may be some variations, but we're all headed in the same direction and we're all within the guardrails. So building in flexibility that allows us to serve different types of students with different needs um, to address different needs of different employees who can all be effective employees with, with slight variances in how they work. Um, I'm thinking about what are those guardrails that, that keep us all on the same road, moving in the same direction, but allow the necessary flexibility for us to respond um, to a crisis and also respond to the variations in, in different needs that we all have. So le leading those different new through those different nuances, but making sure that still people are, are in a certain domain, that there, there, is, there is some parameters there. Good, that's great. And Deborah, you get the last word. Oh, may I steal Johnny's word and say, I don't know what happens in a post-pandemic world. Uh, I agree with all of my colleagues. And, and what I hear is that adaptability, which is one of our core values, is gonna be even more important than, than ever. I think more so than uh, changing the leadership styles uh, during the pandemic, that the pandemic has tested all of our various leadership styles. Uh, and in many ways, I think we'll be better coming in after it. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's a thing called crucibles of leadership that we come out stronger and wiser and more resilient. And so I think we've all been through that to a certain extent. Um, I want to thank you guys. It was absolutely fantastic from my perspective. I, you know, every, every interaction was just so powerful and, and instructive. So thank you. Um, and I'll turn it over to Jonathan to see if he's got any uh, last words. Well, no, I don't. I really, I, I will echo, uh, I will echo um, Chuck's words. This has been fantastic. This has been a great discussion of, of sort of both uh, perspectives on leadership, but also just perspectives on the way campuses sort of have their own context. And I really want to thank you all for all of the contributions you've made. And again, thank the audience for, for sticking around. This has been wonderful. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your uh, rest of your summit. Uh, and if, again, if there's ways that we can help, please let us know. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.